Science fiction tends to portray planetary invasions as just a couple of battalions of troops attacking one outpost somewhere. As we'll see today, it's a much bigger endeavor than that. So today's topic is planetary assaults and invasions, as part of our continuing look at how conflict and warfare might differ in the future. The problem being, it's a pretty big topic, and not really one we can exhaust in just one or even several videos. It also involves a lot of overlapping topics and includes many different scenarios. The most classic one is that a spaceship pulls up in orbit and drops pods full of infantry down to a planet to fight a comparably able enemy. I'm not sure who first explored this concept, but the one that popularized it was Starship Troopers, the book by Robert Heinlein. We will not even discuss the film of the same name, which I thought was quite funny but had nothing to do with the novel. Quite a few of our books of the month have been adapted into films or TV shows, and some more faithfully than others. Often the less faithful ones are entirely forgettable garbage, but like I said I rather enjoyed the film. Maybe the biggest difference between the book and the film though is that the book is very cerebral. While the film is only cerebral in the sense that they have these big brain bugs that can suck out your cerebellum. While the novel spends a lot of time discussing philosophy and debating some controversial ideas, it is probably best known for introducing the mobile infantry and the idea of units of guys running around in power armor that made them walking tanks, something also missing from the film entirely. This isn't a new idea nowadays, but it very much was when Heinlein wrote about it and it's going to be part of our focus for today. It's a great novel by one of the most influential sci-fi writers of his era, and you can pick up a free copy of Starship Troopers today, and also get a 30 day trial of Audible, just use my link, audible.com slash Isaac, or text Isaac to 500-500. The first big issue with planetary assault or invasion is the question why you'd even do one. Why not just torch the planet from orbit? Why even enter orbit when the sorts of ships we tend to see engage in this could have done more damage by just flying by at their normal cruising speed and dumping their garbage out in airlock to hit the planet as they passed? The sheer damage a ship can do ramming something at such speeds also tends to get skipped in fiction a lot. It most recently got used in the newest Star Wars film, The Last Jedi in a scene that everyone agrees was visually gorgeous but didn't make much sense. Not because doing that much damage didn't make sense, if anything that was way less than it should have been, but rather that since nobody ever did that in the franchise before, when it's such an obvious tactic, one assumes it must be impossible for some reason. Not a new problem either. The Enterprise considers a warp speed ramming of the Borg Cube at the end of the best of both worlds. They don't do it, but the very notion that they consider that, even as a last ditch measure that might work, begs the question of why no one else in their fleet tried that while the Borg were smashing them up at Wolf 359, and ramming ships into things as last minute sacrifices is quite common in sci-fi. We had the main protagonist of the Babylon 5 series, John Sheridan, order one during the attack on Earth at the end of Season 4 too. And the answer is very simple. Fleets pounding away on each other and slowly getting destroyed is a lot more interesting than waves of suicide attacks by lower mass ships with skeleton crews or unmanned ships doing it, but that final stand, a desperate moment of sacrifice, is very dramatic. It just has the problems of making people wonder why they don't do that more often, since it clearly makes more sense. Spaceships have insane amounts of kinetic energy, hence why we always say there is no such thing as an unarmed spaceship. So why invade a planet at all? There's a few reasons that are believable enough, they just don't apply well to the classic super evil genocidal bad guys, but we'll get one out of the way at the start. Interstellar civilizations do not invade planets for their resources, at least not the raw materials. Most of those would still be there, even if you smashed the place so hard and thoroughly the entire surface turned to glass, and what wasn't, like the water and air, would just meander around the vicinity of the planet for easy collection anyway. Also, inhabited planets aren't ever likely to represent a particularly large chunk of available raw materials in the galaxy, or even a given solar system compared to what uninhabited planets represent. If we look at our system, gas giants are good examples. Nor would you do it just for the genetic information or knowledge they collected, since both are easily obtained with a minimum of invasion. 
you probably don't have to threaten to torch the Earth, let alone send troops down to seize our capitals, to get a copy of Wikipedia or DNA samples of various flora and fauna unique to Earth. You just ask, though if someone demands too steep a price for those, you might point out that you'd be happy to send your own people down to collect them in person. So the motivation to assault or invade a planet has to rest on some reason you'd want it essentially intact. Maybe you want the industries in place still, but then you could just drop tons of neutron bombs or viruses or nerve gas down. Someone asked me once how long you could keep breathing on a planet on which all life had just been sterilized with no new oxygen being produced, and the answer was actually many millions of years. A typical human might go through a couple hundred kilograms of oxygen a year, but the atmosphere has about a billion billion kilograms in it, so even a few billion people would need a million years to burn through all of that, and at least many tens of thousands of years to build up enough carbon dioxide to cause breathing problems. That's plenty of time to re-terraform a planet, which is a lot easier in this sort of scenario. Basically they have to have some reason to want the people on that planet to mostly survive, and as we've mentioned before, while you might use them as slaves, if you've got them anyway, manpower is probably never a driving motivation for a high-tech civilization. You might be enslaving them for their mental efforts rather than physical, but trying to get science conducted or poetry composed at gunpoint probably isn't too effective. This hardly means we're short on motives though, it just means those all have to match up to a mindset of wanting to take the place and its people mostly intact. Maybe it's a civil war, maybe it's outright conquest but there's a lot of other folks watching from the sidelines who might jump in if you start committing atrocities. Also a lot of your own people, or their own people, might be okay with conquest but would rebel if you went too far. The next planet you encounter fights to the last, while other previously neutral planets attack you and elements of your own population sabotage you at home. The other two misconceptions are that a fleet around a planet essentially has it at its mercy and that it is a fleet just against a planet. As we mentioned in Interplanetary Warfare, odds are good you don't just fly from your planet to another, stopping for nothing except maybe a tussle with their fleet along the way. You've probably had to fight your way through many lines of defense at a relative crawl only to encounter some gigantic orbital defense network made of thousands if not millions of huge fortresses that don't have to worry about pushing mass around like a ship does. Even when you've managed to clear that all out, and the insane amounts of dangerous debris it will have left behind if you were just blowing it all up, now you have to contend with a planet. We think of ourselves as being very vulnerable in a case like that because we know how much damage a single asteroid can do to us currently, but we're not. You might have a few billion tons of ship orbiting above ready to hammer that planet, but they've got the entirety of a planetary economy and industry to work with, and effectively infinite raw materials. Since the first rule of warfare is not to pick fights with people bigger than you, if you're doing something like this, it probably means tens of thousands of giant battleships, not a dozen or so strike cruisers. Yes, even just one interstellar ship could give a planet a pretty good pounding, but only if it's sitting still and taking it. Odds are it is not and has cannons lying around bigger than your whole ship. If you're fighting off planetary invasions, you're not a 24th century civilization. You've probably got super tall towers made out of ultra strong graphene or similar built by robots, but that also means you have enormous underground bunkers and factories built and manned by those same automatons. Trying to bombard or dig out a civilization that's retreated to diamond hard bunkers a kilometer under the ground is easier said than done especially if you can't use nukes or kinetic strikes because they are war crimes and someone's enforcing that. But even if they're not, yeah, you're dropping nukes and asteroids on them and they're flinging up whole mountains worth of ordnance right back at you. None of these people are using chemistry as their propellant or they wouldn't be sending giant ships out to invade planets, so that whole gravity well issue doesn't matter because the delta V difference between dropping something down on a planet and shooting up from it just isn't that big an advantage. It still is one, everything you send down is stronger than what they send up, but you are on board a ship where every centimeter of armor costs you a lot of energy in terms of acceleration as well as maneuverability, while they are down on a planet where they can cover everything in dirt and rock much thicker and cheaper and will not run out of ammo, ever. You have to ship in all your supplies, and they probably have fleet remnants or allies who can harass your shipping, 
Yes, you've got engines so powerful they can roast whole metropolitan regions when turned on, but they probably have countless factories and power plants of their own able to make those too. So it's not a one-sided conflict, or if it is, it's probably in the opposite direction of what you'd expect. As best as we can tell, planets in the far future are likely to be local focuses, not where most people actually live, meaning you've got four fairly plausible scenarios for one. It might be some ancient massive Ecumenopolis and local capital, in which case it's been around a long time and has disproportionate resources, probably not just swarmed around with orbital infrastructure and defenses, but layers of underground facilities. It might be some place that was carefully terraformed for centuries to be Earth-like, meaning it's literally older than dirt and represents massive investments of time and resources to make it that way, and smashing it up will offend everyone involved in that or who came from places that pursued the same path. It might be some new and sparsely settled place doing the same, in which case bombarding it is overkill and pointless, as what few people live there are basically living in bunkers while terraforming the place anyway. Or it could be something devoted almost entirely to industry or sentiment, a giant factory of a planet slowly eating it, which is unlikely to be a soft target, or some shrine world carefully terraformed and left mostly uninhabited maybe. Key point being that most planets in the distant future are likely to have some role that makes them a place you might want to take over, but either realistically can't or need to do cautiously to avoid damage or outrage. It's hard to guess if such an attack would be a blitzkrieg or a dragged out siege, but if it is a siege, it's likely to be because you're slowly grinding away morale and layers of defense, rather than hoping to starve them out. I'd also tend to guess that most fleets orbiting a planet to besiege it wouldn't be in a mostly circular low orbit, but probably a very elliptical one that just brought them in for fast passes, then out again for the long swing back around. And again, since we have to assume they've got a lot more Delta V than a modern ship, they can get away with changing position and orbit a lot too, slam on the gas as you're approaching so you get there before they expect it on this pass and over a different spot. They also probably have a ton of orbital infrastructure you need to deal with too, not even counting the swarm of habitats and fortresses hanging around the vicinity of that planet, you tend to expect them to have that main ground space infrastructure, be that space elevators or skyhooks or launch loops or orbital rings. If you want those intact, you either have to threaten to blow them up and hope they'll surrender, or send in the marines. And unlike an actual planetary invasion, where you'd expect a lot of tanks and artillery and air support to come down, not just infantry, an orbital installation is presumably going to be built around the human scale, and even if they're aliens it isn't likely to be too different. That also means it really isn't necessarily all big guns. If you're fighting your way down a corridor, close combat weapons and shields still make a lot of sense. This also does not necessarily mean those marines are human, they might be drones or androids driven by AI or remote controlled, but they should be of around that scale. You probably can't go driving tanks or giant humanoid robots around inside. This doesn't mean the future of warfare is just robots fighting other robots though. Remote controlled stuff can be jammed, especially inside some installation you're trying to take over. You'd be talking about a pretty high bandwidth signal that's heavily encrypted, not exactly the hardest thing to interfere with. Also, even time lags of milliseconds can be too much if you're in the realm where those drones are artificial intelligence or cyborgs. Problem is, if you're using things like that for your troops, you're probably using it all over your civilization for other things, rather than negating the advantage. If you've got superhuman AI, there's a pretty good chance you don't use those for protecting your civilization. Instead, they are your civilization. Same for if you're making superhumans, even if they aren't actively replacing normal people, they're probably running everything. Unless you strictly use artificial intelligence or cyborgs or genetic enhancements for military purposes, which is probably a bad idea. A common theme of a lot of science fiction is some group of soldiers created just to fight, be it some defense computer or genetically engineered super soldiers who then decide they either should be in charge of the whole civilization, since they are clearly superior, or want to torch it down, either because they are angry at who made them or they just really love destroying stuff. There is a big difference between career military and being created or raised to do that, not for a living, but as your fundamental purpose. Normally you'd expect whatever advantages you have to mostly be possessed by the enemy too, so that both sides have their own super soldiers who aren't that super anymore, 
but you could easily imagine ideological wars where one side hates cyborgs and uses backbone genetically enhanced ones, while the other side does use cyborgs. Paints an interesting picture, but putting it bluntly, the cyborgs are going to maul the other side. Particularly since they probably also use genetic enhancement on any bits they don't use machines for. One big difference in the future though is that your troops probably won't be particularly afraid to die. Odds are their brains or programs are backed up somewhere if they do. Now, not everyone would consider that backup to be them, but that's essentially a matter of opinion, not something you can prove or disprove, and whatever the real answer is about preservation of identity doesn't matter, just what that person thinks it is. If half the population thinks backing people up is pointless, except to allow their general knowledge to be preserved, and the other half regards it as genuine immortality, you just do your recruiting from them. Fictional stories usually need to focus on people, though they don't have to be classically human, any more than Superman, Thor, Worf, or Commander Data are, three aliens, and an AI. But sticking regular people into power armor or giving them implants or drugs is pretty common. And it is plausible enough if you're either trying to avoid having artificial intelligence run your civilization, or even comprise such a civilization, since presumably a default AI is not as combat effective as one designed or overhauled for combat. Our Book of the Month, Starship Troopers, essentially started the power armor trope, though there are prior examples and it's usually presented as medieval knights or samurai in space. I think that might be a little more true in some ways than we tend to think too, because such folks often had a retinue along with them, and I could easily see people hulking around in power armor having a lot of smaller robots with them. Some might be running around bringing in ammo or resupplies of some liquid metal for patching holes in your armor, maybe they're bringing in new batteries or some super soldier drug like Ketracel White from Deep Space Nine. Your civilization might not be okay with superhuman or human AI, but it's bound to have a lot of smart automation. So instead of someone carrying around a big shield or cannon, it might just walk around on its own two legs, or four, and something like that would be hard to jam since you probably don't need much bandwidth or range. And wire is cheap, so it and you might have some external port it could shoot a comm cable to, if someone started jamming. Heck, an invading force might have long wires running back to their own boarding ship providing power, Something like that could be cut, but self-healing wires, or little bots running along who can quickly reconnect them, would be on the table, limiting your need for batteries to only needing minutes of operational capacity. That's a big issue for power armor, the whole point of the stuff is that it lets you carry far more armor than any human could manage, even above the superhuman strength and speed it's supposed to offer. Such things would be insane power gluttons. As we mentioned last month in Portable Power, modern batteries have virtually no capacity, and you wouldn't want to be trapped in some heavy powered exoskeleton if the batteries ran out. Even if your armor used batteries, which is quite probable considering materials like graphene get discussed as both unbelievably strong and potentially great capacitors, you probably don't have hours or days of high energy performance available. Such things would take kilowatts to run on just to walk and that means you either need batteries much more energy dense than chemical fuels, which is certainly not the case nowadays, or you need an onboard generator or an external power supply, though obviously if you had the last you still want to include batteries. Antimatter, if you've got it, is probably not a good choice for a generator or fuel, like nitroglycerin it's pretty much going to explode unless handled with amazing delicacy which is pretty much never going to happen with something like power armor. You prefer something that's inert and doesn't blow everything up on accident, makes a very nice parting gift for your enemies if you blow up when killed, but besides getting your allies too, that really would never be handy in any case where you were using infantry, if you're just trying to blow stuff up, use a missile. Nuclear is an option but it would probably need to be transuranic, something with a fairly short half-life like some fermium isotope, just days gives a good power supply by mass and lets you restock on comfortable combat timelines, and it's something you might be able to make in a ship's reactor by bombarding another material with neutrons. There's a pretty good chance long-lived beta decaying isotopes would be regular batteries in the future, but more expensive, higher powered and shorter lived elements might be used a lot specifically for military applications like this. 
There are other options too, again see portable power for details, but the important thing to remember is that you need a very durable, compact, light, and high powered battery or generator to run stuff like this. If you don't have those, you don't have power armor. Amusingly you might not need it if that were the case because nobody would be turning around railguns or laser rifles either, but that doesn't mean they don't have low-tech chemical propellant bullets that never miss because they have a tiny guidance package on them or a computer in the gun that was quite capable of tweaking the barrel to hit the target so long as you aimed it vaguely in the right direction and it knew what the target was. Very precise weapons are probably a lot more likely in the future, So instead of power armored individuals smashing down a corridor, dumping buckets full of ammo at each other, it might just be a lot of automated systems constantly trying to outmaneuver each other till a single shot gets fired. Spray and pray is already a pretty ineffective approach compared to aiming a single shot or quick burst anyway, and our modern guns don't have computers in them. You probably need extreme accuracy anyway, you'd be unlikely to get anything delicate and smart through someone's armor and just punching a small hole through someone generally won't kill them, even if it's through a vital organ considering there might be all sorts of automated systems that can plug up the bleeding and start pumping your blood for you. Even a headshot might not kill a cyborg, as they could easily have a backup brain in their boot or have their consciousness spread around to a hundred systems where you need to break fifty to really do much or the exact right three to cripple some part of their mind. Probably not a pleasant job though, considering that even if you take the installation, they might blow it up themselves, but none of this really applies unless both sides are trying to keep the destruction and loss of life fairly limited, or at least the former. Again if your civilization is pretty transhuman in nature, then they might not care if their body gets destroyed as they're backed up, and odds are any civilian population in residence could be quickly turned into pretty combat affected troops themselves. They might just be able to download a whole combat database into their head, Matrix style, and cheerfully throw themselves at the enemy as entirely willing cannon fodder. Indeed they might not need to. We don't really encourage folks to simulate combat for fun much these days, though a lot of other cultures did just that as the basis of a lot of sports, but people certainly enjoy video games of that sort, and while those are mostly nothing at all like actual combat, that is unlikely to remain true as things like virtual reality emerge. Now fellow veterans are probably saying, yeah Isaac it's still not like real combat because you're not terrified you'll die, but again that element wouldn't likely apply if your brain is backed up somewhere, or if you know hack their brain so that they shall know no fear. But even ignoring those options, a lot of the point of training is to make sure you've practiced something so many times you do it reflexively even if the world is falling apart around you and that training is not conducted in life and death situations but works just fine, for the most part, and I'd expect combat simulations would be very popular in the future. Which is fairly important when you're invading the planet too, because it means you probably can't show up with a few thousand or million super troops just to fight their full-time military, you probably need to invade with a force of a similar size to their own population. Again, they can probably be manufacturing weapons, gear, and ammo throughout the invasion and might have lots of stockpiles, and they might not need to give people much training in terms of actual time to make them decently combat worthy. So probably not dropping a few battalions down, but tens of thousands of divisions down instead. Keep in mind on Ecumenopolis, even if only 1% of your population is trained and equipped enough to usefully fight, that could easily be billions of people. These are vast conflicts. It is worth remembering every war we know of was between just two of many factions from this one planet fighting for a small chunk of it, yet many of those involved millions of people in continent-wide battles lasting years. And this is all assuming you don't land next to some apparent mountain that you eventually realize is nothing but a hundred trillion fairly smart combat drones just sitting there in storage. If you've got good enough self-replicating systems, you could easily find yourself fighting an entire planet in a very literal sense, as all the ground under you just turns into very smart weapon systems. Definitely not the traditional view we have of planetary invasion, but probably a lot more likely. At the same time, we can definitely contemplate such things occurring, rather than just ending in an utter wipeout by orbital bombardment. So you could have invasions conducted by ground forces, and if that involves human troops in any direct combat capacity, odds are they would be wearing some sort of power armor or be inside a vehicle. 
As I said at the start of this series, I wouldn't expect anyone to ever use giant humanoid war machines, but power armor is a lot more plausible, and tanks, while mostly absent from sci-fi, probably would be too. Truth be told though, I'd expect planetary assaults or invasions to almost never happen. As we've noticed throughout the series, high-tech warfare is pretty much either going to be so absolutely destructive that folks probably would tend to avoid it, or bound up in rules to prevent that from happening. If so, you tend to think they'd be the sort of people who could agree to purely proxy or simulated resolutions without real shots needing to be fired. Of course if everybody regards getting shot as just meaning you need a new body, they might regard actual combat as exactly that. As to the novel, it's one of those books that gets recommended by virtually everyone even though arguing about Heinlein's views on life and philosophy tends to be almost as popular as the plots. I think a lot of that is that the protagonist, Johnny Rico, is just very engaging. He feels like a very normal person you can just follow along with, as the sort of book you typically won't put down till you're done. It's inspired countless other novels and adaptations, from the great to the terrible, but the original is still the best in my opinion. You can pick up a free copy of Starship Troopers today, just use my link in the episode's description, audible.com slash Isaac, or text Isaac to 500-500 to get a free book and a 30 day free trial, and that book is yours to keep whether you stay on with Audible or not, and if you don't enjoy it, you can swap it out for a different book at any time. Next week we will be returning to the post-scarcity series to continue our look at how such civilizations might function, with a focus on how their very view of reality might change. The week after that we'll explore the notion that ancient alien civilizations might have visited us in the past, and explore this premise in light of our discussion about post-scarcity and high-tech civilizations. For alerts when that and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel, and if you enjoyed this episode, hit the like button and share it with others. Until next time, thanks for watching and have a great week.